What I wanted to talk about today is what I call the basic argument for diophysitism. Um, I have a discussion of this argument in a book on the uh, Trinity and Incarnation that I am going to be publishing probably next year. Uh, so you can see a longer form discussion of this argument in that book when it comes out. But what, what I wanted to do today is to share what I think is a, a basic argument for diophysitism and to respond to it and to give two objections. So let's begin. What is diophysitism? Diophysitism is the doctrine that Jesus Christ is a single person in two natures, or diophysis in Greek. That's where the word diophysitism comes from. Uh, one divine and the other human. So this means that the one individual named Jesus, that one person, is such as to count as both divine and human. Uh, we can say in more philosophical terms that he exemplifies both divinity and humanity. He's a single person who is perfectly divine and perfectly human. So everything that goes into being divine, he is that way. Everything that goes into being human, he is that way uh, in a single person. Now, there is what I will call a basic argument for diophysitism that has been proposed by Christian theologians in the Catholic tradition for effectively 2,000 years. And by Catholic here, I do not mean Roman Catholicism per se. What I mean is a certain sort of mainstream of Christian theology um, that in the second and third century first distinguished itself from Gnosticism and various forms of Gnosticism as being properly apostolic by means of Episcopal succession. So they first argue that we have the true apostolic faith, apostolic faith because um, our teachings comes from the apostles by means of bishops that have been established in the church uh, from generation to generation. And then later, this same Catholic tradition uh, codified and uh, formulated its beliefs in an official way in the so-called ecumenical councils of the third through, excuse me, of the fourth through eighth centuries. Uh, so that's what I mean when I talk about Catholic tradition. I don't mean Roman Catholicism. I mean this sort of mainstream Christian theology, this Episcopal conciliar tradition, if you want to call it that. What is this basic argument? Well, the idea is as follows. Because things are said of the human being, Jesus, which normally can only be said of God, or of a person with a divine nature. Therefore, he, Jesus, is both human and God, or both divine and human, a person with a divine nature in addition to his human nature. And the Westminster Larger Catechism provides a very elegant summary of this argument in question 11. How doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? And the answer, the scriptures manifest that the Son and Holy Ghost are equal with God the Father, ascribing unto them such names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper to God only. So this is the basic idea. Things are said about Christ that normally could only be said of God, and so therefore, in addition to being a human being, Christ must also be God or divine. One can find many historical examples of the basic argument from the earliest days of the Christian religion, as I said. So here is a first example from Irenaeus of Lyon, commenting on Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, uh, which is the episode with the healing of the disabled man, where... Uh, uh, the Pharisees ask, who can forgive sins but God alone? This is what Irenaeus says. Therefore, by remitting sins, he, namely Christ, did indeed heal man, while he also manifested himself who he was. For if no one can forgive sins but God alone, while the Lord remitted and healed them, it is plain that he was himself the word of God made the son of man. And that is in Against Heresies, book 5, chapter 17, section 3. Uh, and Tertullian, in his book Against Marcion, in book 4, uh, section 10, chapter 10, gives basically the same idea here. The idea is that because only God can forgive sins, but Christ, this human being, forgives sins, therefore he must be God in addition to being a human being. And there's another example in the author Novation from the 3rd century, uh, commenting on John chapter 8, verse 51, where Christ says, Whoever keeps my word will never see death. This is what Novation says. Certainly he is not man only who gives immortality, which if he were only man, he could not give. But by giving divinity, by immortality, he proves himself to be God by offering divinity, which if he were not God, he could not give. That's in book, his book on the Trinity, chapter 15. So Novation's argument is very simple. How is it that if you keep Christ's word, you can become immortal and never die, which is basically to become divine? Uh, Novation argues very clearly, well, if Christ is offering divinity, he has to be himself divine. He could not be a mere human being and offering divinity because that would exceed his powers. So in addition to being human, he has to also be divine. 
One can also find contemporary theologians and biblical scholars proposing this basic argument in defense of the idea of a high Christology in the New Testament. Um, Oliver Crisp, who uh, is a Reformed theologian and he was my Dr. Vader, I did my PhD under him, he defines a high Christology as an understanding of Christ according to which Christ is more, at least more than a human being. Uh, so he can be God himself, he can be some sort of lesser divine being, he can be an angel, whatever. But the idea behind high Christology is that Christ is at, at least more than a human being. He's something greater than a human being. And so, for example, we have Richard Bauckham. Uh, he says that Jesus is included in the divine identity, so to speak, because typically divine actions and properties are ascribed to him in the New Testament. For example, um, the creation of the world, Bauckham would say, um, and the rightful reception of worship alongside the Father and so on. Uh, these are things that you, uh, Bauckham thinks indicates that Jesus is included in the divine identity because things that are normally only said about God are also said about him. And that means that he's divine. And you can see his book, Jesus and the God of Israel for that. Uh, and then there's Sigurd Grindheim. Uh, he says, quote, the Jesus who emerges from the synoptic gospels is a Jesus who said and did what only God could say and do, end quote. And so these scholars argue that because Jesus does things, says things, etc., things are said about him that normally only God could say or do, or normally you would only say about God, therefore Jesus is divine. He is God in addition to being a human being. And then I have a couple more quotes here. One's from Thomas Joseph White, uh, a Roman Catholic uh, theologian. He says, quote, Christ bears within himself a power and authority akin to that of God. He can perform actions that are normally reserved to God alone. We see this in the opening chapters of Mark when Jesus forgives sins by his own authority, to which the Pharisees respond, who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark seemingly would have us understand that Jesus himself has the authority to forgive sins that is proper to the Lord of Israel, end quote. And so in the opening chapter of that book, uh, Thomas Joseph White gives a very nice summary of sort of the basic uh, case that you can make for the divinity of Christ uh, from the New Testament, drawing from a lot of early high Christology proponents and contemporary biblical uh, studies. And again, the basic argument is there. Things are said of Jesus, which normally could only be said of God. Therefore, Jesus is God. And here we have a couple of philosophers, J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig. Uh, in an article on the Trinity, they write, quote, something of a consensus has emerged among New Testament critics that in his teachings and actions, such as his assertion of personal authority, his revising of the divinely given Mosaic law, his proclamation of the inbreaking of God's reign or kingdom into history in his person, his performing miracles and exorcisms as signs of the advent of that kingdom, his messianic pretensions to restore Israel, and his claim to forgive sins. In all of these ways, Jesus enunciated an implicit Christology, putting himself in God's place, end quote. Now, there's one book uh, that I think does a very good job of summarizing all these arguments that you might make, and that is Robert Bowman and uh, Ed Komoshevsky's book, uh, Putting Jesus in His Place, The Case for the Deity of Christ. And this is uh, basically their argument is that Jesus is divine because in the New Testament, he is said to share in the honors, attributes, names, deeds, and the seat of the throne of God. And so this book presents a very comprehensive case for the deity of Christ from a number of different angles in a single volume. So it's very convenient. It's a good resource to have. Now, here's a first objection that we can make to this point of view. Uh, here's a first argument, we might say. There are the inference to the deity of Jesus is not so easy because there are a lot of things said about Christ in the Bible that are not or normally cannot be said about God. So for example, uh, Jesus is said to be born and you can give an account of his genesis, uh, Biblos Geneseos. So that's a, a, a typo there in the Greek in Biblos. So you can, you can say that Jesus is born. You can say where he came from and when he began. Uh, whereas of God, the psalmist says that he's from everlasting to everlasting. And John Levinson uh, notes that there is no explanation of God's origins anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. He doesn't come from anywhere. He doesn't have an origin. He simply always is. And everything comes from him. Uh, a second thing that's said about Jesus, he grows in wisdom, age, and favor from God and men. God, on the other hand, created wisdom at the beginning, uh, Proverbs chapter 8. And he has never been taught by anybody. Nobody's ever been his counselor, Isaiah 40. Jesus is tempted and he goes hungry. Uh, God, on the other hand, cannot be tempted, and he does not need anything at all. And so in Psalm 50, there's a very wonderful line. If I were, if, you know, he says, uh, do I eat the blood of bulls and of goats? If I needed anything, would I ask you? 
the whole world is mine, right? I would not ask you for anything because I don't need anything. Uh, so Jesus obviously has needs. He suffers. He goes hungry. None of those things are problems for God. Jesus is empowered by the Spirit, and he says that he can do nothing on his own. Uh, God, on the other hand, does everything by his own power. Uh, he simply speaks, and, and things happen as he says. Jesus, according to Matthew, is given all authority. Uh, things are put into his own authority. Whereas what's said of God in the Old Testament is that he owns everything by right. The, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, finally, uh, the New Testament says about Jesus that he suffered and that he died. Whereas it says about God that he alone is immortal. And so we might think uh, from these examples that there are things said of Jesus which normally cannot be said of God at all. And so the inference to the deity, the divinity of Jesus, might be undermined. Now the response from the proponent of diaphysitism is as follows. This proves that Jesus has two natures. It's just that the typically divine things are said of him in virtue of his divine nature, and the typically creaturely things are said of him in virtue of his assumed human nature. So the idea is that, uh, yes, it's true, things are said about Jesus which normally could not be said of God, but that's because Jesus is not only God, he is also man. And so the lowly things, the things that could not be said of God, those are said of him with respect to his human nature, um, the high things that could only be said of God, those are said of him with respect to his divine nature. And so this phenomenon of the two ways that the New Testament speaks about Jesus proves that he's a person with two natures. Now, this method for interpreting the New Testament is called partitive exegesis. And so a contemporary scholar, R.B. Jamieson, he defines it as follows. Partitive exegesis is a reading strategy that recognizes that the New Testament authors write of Christ in two distinct complementary registers, the divine and the human. And that distinguishes between what they describe to what they ascribe to Christ insofar as he is divine and insofar as he has become human. So the, the New Testament talks about Jesus in two ways. It talks about him as divine and it also talks about him as human. And so we have to distinguish those predications. Uh, there are very traditional classic statements of this principle. For example, in Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, he says, In sum, you must predicate the more sublime expressions of the Godhead, of the nature which transcends bodily experiences and the lowlier ones of the compound, of him who, because of you, was emptied, became incarnate, and, to use equally valid language, was made man, end quote. And then finally, we have this in Thomas Aquinas, quote, those passages of scripture by which the heretics endeavored to show that Christ is not God by nature are of no avail to prove their contention. For we confess that in Christ, the Son of God, after the mystery of the incarnation, there were two natures, namely the human and the divine. Hence, both those things that are proper to God are said of him by reason of his divine nature, and those things that would seem to savor of imperfection are said of him by reason of his human nature, end quote. Now, partitive exegesis is the hermeneutical corollary uh, to the ontological principle of the communicatio idiomatum. Uh, communicatio idiomatum means basically the sharing of properties or the transfer of properties, the communication of properties in Latin. And the communicatio idiomatum says that because Jesus Christ is a single person in two natures, the properties of either nature can be rightly attributed to him as their single subject. So here's a, a quote from a contemporary theologian, Ian McFarland. Because in Jesus, both divine and human natures are united in one hypostasis, in one person, one individual, any of the properties or idiom, idiomata in Greek um, of either nature are rightly predicated of the single hypostatic someone that Jesus is. And so the basic argument for diophysitism can be summarized as follows. Because things are said of the human being Jesus in the New Testament, which normally can only be said of God or of a person with a divine nature, therefore he is both divine and human. Those things said about Jesus in the New Testament, which normally could not be said of God, must be understood to apply to him in virtue of his assumed human nature. And because Jesus is a single person in two natures, it is always possible to speak of him simply with reference to only one or the other nature, as the New Testament apparently does. Uh, so it's possible to say simple sentences. Jesus suffers, Jesus forgives sins, Jesus created the world, Jesus died. Um, these simple sentences can equally be said of him because he has two natures. And so the truth of those sentences has to be understood with reference to one or the other nature. Now let's make an objection. The first objection to make against the basic argument for diophysitism is that it is logically invalid. This means that the conclusion does not follow from the premises. Uh, in other words, one can grant that things are said of Jesus in the New Testament, which normally can only be said of God. We can say that. That's right. That's perfectly true. Uh, 
This does not mean, however, that Jesus is God or a person with a divine nature. Now, why not? Uh, let's make a distinction here between two ways that a thing can possess a property or a quality. Uh, there are two ways that a thing can possess a quality or property, originally or derivatively. All right, this is my terminology. Let's say a thing possesses a quality originally if it possesses it simply in virtue of what it is. In other words, in virtue of its nature. A thing possesses a quality derivatively if it possesses it in virtue of the action of something else upon it. So let me give an example try to try to illustrate this point. Uh, human beings possess the capacity to learn language originally. In other words, simply in virtue of what they are as human beings. So if you're born a human being, assuming that nothing else goes wrong with you in the course of your development, you have the power to learn language. Okay, you don't need to be given this power by anybody else. You don't need to, nothing needs to happen to you in order for you to have this power. Simply as a human being, you have this capacity to learn language, assuming your development is normal, of course. But human beings possess speaking knowledge of English. So the, the actual speaking knowledge of a particular language, they possess that quality only derivatively through the assistance of parents, friends, teachers, etc. So you can be born a human being, and as long as everything goes normally, you possess the power to, to learn language that belongs to you originally by nature. Uh, but whether or not you speak English is not something that belongs to you by nature, because otherwise, if you didn't speak English, you wouldn't be a human being. Rather, the ability to speak English is something that you have derivatively. It's because you were taught English and made capable of this by other people, by your parents, your teachers, your friends, and so on. So also, we can give the following example. The sun illuminates the surface of the earth originally in virtue of its native luminousness. That's because just given what sort of a thing the sun is, it produces light. And so it has the power to illuminate the surface of the earth originally, simply in virtue of what it is. The moon, however, illuminates the surface of the earth, let's say on a full moon. Uh, derivatively, by reflecting the light of the sun. So given what sort of the thing the, the, the moon is, it cannot produce light on its own. The only way you can illuminate the surface of the earth is if it reflects light from the sun. But the sun itself can produce light on its own, given the kind of thing that it is. So that's the difference between the original possession of a property or a quality and the derivative, right? Original means by nature, derivative means through the assistance of something else. So let's see, how is this argument invalid? Here's the basic argument. Uh, normally only God or a person with a divine nature is said to be X, take whatever quality you want to forgive sins, blah, 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 whatever. Normally only God is said to be X. Uh, Jesus is said to be X. And so therefore Jesus is God. There's an argument. Here's a parody example to show that it's invalid, that the conclusion doesn't follow. Normally only the sun is said to illuminate the surface of the earth, but the moon is said to illuminate the surface of the earth. Let's say during a full moon. And so therefore the moon is the same sort of thing as the sun or the moon simply is the sun. Now, is that argument good? Does, does this argument prove that the moon is the sun or that it's the same sort of thing as the sun? No, obviously not. Because both the moon and the sun can illuminate the surface of the earth, but one does so originally and the other one does so derivatively, okay? So the problem with the basic argument is that it doesn't respect this difference between original and derivative possession of equality. It's true, Jesus can be said to do things that God does, but it still remains an open question. Does he do them originally by his own native power or does he do so derivatively in virtue of the assistance of something else? So th that shows that the, the basic argument for diaphysitism is logically invalid. The conclusion does not follow from the premises. The proponent of the basic argument for diaphysitism needs to reformulate his or her argument in order to be something like this. And this would be a valid argument. Only God, or a person with a divine nature is X by nature. And X, just fill in the blank, whatever predicate you want. Uh, Jesus is said to be X by nature, and so therefore Jesus is God, or a person with a divine nature. Now this argument is logically valid. The conclusion follows from the premises. If only God is omnipotent by nature, and Jesus is said to be omnipotent by nature, then Jesus is God. That's a, ver that's a valid argument. The, the conclusion would follow from the truth of the premises in that case. But the problem is that the second premise is unjustifiable. All right, the second premise says that Jesus is said to be X by nature. The problem is that the New Testament nowhere uses the words for nature, namely physis or usia, in connection with Jesus, let alone specify that specifically divine qualities and powers belong to him by nature. So here's the first problem with this basic argument for diaphysitism. In its simple formulation, it's logically invalid. Once you make it logically invalid, the second premise is unjustifiable. Nowhere is Jesus ever said to possess a certain divine quality by nature. Okay, so that premise 
cannot be justified on the basis of the New Testament. And so that's a, a first problem with uh, with uh, the basic argument. Here, I'll, I'll summarize it once more. The first objection to make to the basic argument is that it's logically invalid. From the fact that things are said of Jesus, which normally can only be said of God or of a person with a divine nature, it does not follow that Jesus is God or a person with a divine nature. Because it could be that the divine things are said of him, not originally, in other words, not in virtue of what he is by nature, but derivatively in virtue of God's action upon him. Consider how normally only the sun is said to illuminate the surface of the earth. But we can also say that the moon illuminates the surface of the earth, not originally, because it's not the same sort of the thing as the sun, but because it reflects the light which the sun shines upon it, so derivatively. So there's this possibility that the relationship between God and Christ is not one of nature, but rather it's something like the relationship between the moon and the sun. Maybe God, Jesus has these divine properties because God is acting upon him somehow. That's a possibility, okay? And the basic argument does not even consider that possibility. That's what makes it logically invalid. That's the first problem. The second objection, okay? So now let's move on to our second objection. The New Testament attributes both typically divine and typically creaturely things to Christ. That's true. He forgives sins, he suffers, uh, he heals, he exercises demons, he also goes hungry, he dies, and so on. So it talks about him as if he were divine, it talks about him as if he were a creature. How do we know which qualities belong to Jesus originally and which derivatively? Is Jesus a divine person who's become human, or is he a human person who has been made divine in some way? The New Testament answers this question, actually, and it says that the typically divine qualities of Jesus have been given to him by God. In other words, they are derivatively possessed. Uh, here's a, a wonderful line from the Rokovian Catechism in, in its discussion about the deity of Christ. The Rokovian Catechism uh, is a catechism written by Fausto Socinus uh, uh, during the Reformation. It served as the catechism of the Polish Brethren, the Unitarian Church in Poland. And it says the following, the scriptures explicitly declare that whatever of a divine nature Christ possessed, he had received it as a gift from the Father, and refer it to the Holy Spirit, with which he had by the Father been anointed and filled, end quote. So the idea is that whatever is divine about Jesus, the New Testament says that it's a gift from God through the action of the Holy Spirit, through the giving of the Holy Spirit to him. And so this shows that his divinity is derived. It is not original to him. He's not divine by nature, but he's divine in some sense in virtue of the action of God upon him. So let's consider some uh, texts that say this. Here's Matthew chapter 9. Matthew's telling of the healing of the paralytic. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. So here Matthew is commenting. This comment does not appear in Mark, but it appears in Matthew. Um, that the authority by which Jesus forgave the man's sins and healed him of his illness uh, was an authority that God had given to human beings. So it's a, it's a derived, it's a derivatively possessed authority. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this, all things have been handed over to me by my father. Uh, that implies that his possession of all things is derivative. It's something that he, it's, he possesses them in virtue of God's action and not simply by nature. Once more, Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Christ's possession of this authority is derivative. Uh, Luke chapter 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. So Jesus' capacity to bring good news to the poor, his calling is, is derivatively possessed. It's because the spirit anointed him that he has this calling and this capacity. Here's another one from Luke's gospel. Now, if I cast out the demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So here Jesus says very clearly that he does these things by the finger of God or by the power of God. And you can read, um, for example, the passage, the miracles that Moses performs in the court of Pharaoh. Uh, when he performs miracles, uh, uh, Pharaoh's magicians say, uh, how can we compete with these miracles? Uh, this is the finger of God, right? So they understood that God himself was acting through Moses. So it's not that Moses was performing these miracles by his own power, but that God was acting through him. And this is what Christ says is happening. He is casting out demons by the finger or by the power of God. And then in John chapter five, for just as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, 
because he is the son of man. So here Jesus explicitly says that his uh, possession of life and authority is derivative. He does not have it by nature, but he has it in virtue of God's granting these things to him. Here's another one. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether I am, my teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. So there Jesus makes very clearly that the teaching that he is sharing is not his own. It doesn't come from him. It comes from God. And so he possesses it derivatively. Um, I would also note that if Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, as Nicene, Nicene theology says, then there is no distinction between Jesus' speaking on his own and his speaking from God, because he is God. Uh, so Jesus' words here imply that he's not consubstantial, so I would say. Here's another one from John's Gospel. Now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Okay, so he, Jesus is making very clear that his knowledge of the truth, his possession of the truth, is a matter of his hearing it from God. God told it to him. It's not something that belongs to him by nature. Uh, another one, uh, this time in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you. So it's not that, uh, like Irenaeus and Tertullian and Novatian say, it's not that Jesus showed that he was God by his divine power through his miracles, but rather that God was attesting to Jesus through the powers and the miracles that he did through him. Uh, so Peter does not argue like Irenaeus and Tertullian and the rest of them do. He doesn't say that Jesus showed that he was divine by his miracles, but rather the miracles of Jesus proved that God was with him. Another one, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So here, Jesus' ability to do good and to heal and to work miracles is ascribed to God's power being active through him. So it's because God gave him power that he was able to do those things. He did not possess this by nature. And then finally, in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, when he had made purification for sins, namely Jesus, uh, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So here, the superiority of Christ to the angels and the excellence of his name are derivative. He became superior. He wasn't already. Uh, and the name that he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Not the one that he already had, but the one that he inherited. So Jesus' superiority to the angels is a matter of God's action upon him. He became more superior. He became superior to the angels, and he was given a name that is more excellent than theirs. So to summarize, the New Testament writers, the New Testament writes, excuse me, that the various divine qualities of Jesus have been granted to him by God. He has been empowered and authorized by God to accomplish typically divine effects by means of his teaching, his healing, his miracles, forgiving, and so on. This entails, I will argue, that Jesus is not originally divine. In other words, that he is not divine by nature. Now, why should that be so? Here's my argument. If Jesus were divine by nature, he would already possess divine power and authority. If Jesus already possessed divine power and authority, then he could not be given them by God. But the New Testament says that Jesus was given divine power and authority by God, and so therefore Jesus is not divine by nature. So let's see. Let's talk about this uh, argument here. We'll start with the earlier premises. The traditional opinion is that Jesus' incarnation does not take away from his divinity. This is an important thing to recognize. He remains God even after he takes on all the properties of humanity in becoming human. So let's see here from Hillary's book on the Trinity, uh, book 9, uh, chapter 3. For he, being of two natures united for that mediatorship, is the full reality of each nature. While abiding in each, he is wanting in neither. He does not cease to become to be God because he becomes man, nor fail to be man because he remains forever God. And Gregory of Nazianzus, he whom you presently scorn was once transcendent over even you. He who is presently human was in composite. He remained what he was. Okay, so Jesus remained as he was prior to the incarnation. What he was not, he assumed. So the idea here is that Jesus does not cease to be God when he becomes human. Everything that is true about him as God remains true about him as God after he takes on flesh. Uh, Thomas Joseph White, Jesus Christ is, quote, the Lord incarnate, God the Word, become fully human without ceasing to be God, end quote. And Ian McFarland, the divine hypostasis of the Son, or Word, without ceasing to be divine, assume the human nature as Jesus of Nazareth, such that it is true to say that whatever Jesus does, God does. And I will note here that this point is required by the basic argument. So if you're going to offer the basic argument, you have to accept that Jesus does not cease to be God in becoming human. 
because if he had ceased to be God and becoming human, he could not demonstrate his divinity by performing typically divine deeds. All right, every divine thing that he would do would not prove that he's God because he would not have no he would have no divinity to demonstrate. Okay, so if Jesus stops being God after he becomes human, then nothing that he can do can prove that he's God because there's nothing to prove. He's not God. He stopped being God. So Jesus has to remain God even after his incarnation in order for the basic argument to get off the ground. There have he has to be God while human. So everything that's true about him as God has to remain true about him even after he becomes human. Now, what's the significance of this? Here is a principle. Okay, I think it's very intuitive. You cannot be given what you already have, nor can you be made what you already are. All right, you cannot be given what you already have, nor can you be made what you already are. Let me give you an example. You cannot kill a dead person. In other words, you cannot, if a person is dead, you cannot make them dead. They're already dead. Nor can you wet a garment that is already soaked. Okay, so if a garment is soaked, then it's wet. And if it's already wet, you cannot make it wet. So the principle here is that you cannot be given what you already have. If you already have something, it can't be given to you. And if you already, you cannot be made what you already are. So if you already are a certain way, you cannot be made that way. Uh, it's true. A rich person can become richer than they already are. And a fat cat can become fatter. So if you are a certain way, you can be made more that way. That's true. But a rich person cannot be made rich since they are already rich. Nor can a fat cat be made fat since it already is fat. Okay. And the rich person, even if the rich person is made richer, the rich person does not already possess the further money that makes them richer, nor does the cat already possess the fat that makes it fatter. So even when you take a thing and make it more than it is, it does not already have that more. That's why it can be given that more because it does not already have it. Here's another example. You may already have a book. Let's say you already have a copy of the Bible. I can give you another copy of the same book, but I cannot. But you do not already have that particular copy that I can give you, nor can I give you the particular copy that you already have. Okay, so being given something, this is the idea behind this principle. If something is given, it is not already possessed. And if it is already possessed, it cannot be given. All right, if you already know how to speak English, I cannot teach you how to speak English. At best, what I can do is teach you how to speak English better, but the more that I can teach you, you do not already have. Okay, so the idea is this. If something is given, it's not already possessed. If something is already possessed, it cannot be given. That's the basic logic behind this principle. Now, what follows from all this? If Jesus were divine by nature, if he were God, then he would already possess divine power and authority prior to his incarnation because he's divine by nature. It just belongs to him as God. And if Jesus does not cease to be God in becoming human, if he retains his divinity, even after assuming humanity, then he would still possess that divine power and authority even after becoming incarnate. So becoming incarnate would not change, right? If, he's, if he does not cease to be God, he stays omnipotent, he stays omniscient, he stays authoritative, etc., even after becoming human. But if Jesus still possessed divine power and authority upon becoming incarnate, then he could not be given divine power and authority because you cannot be given what you already have. And yet the New Testament says that God empowered and authorized Jesus to perform typically divine works. So the, the New Testament says clearly that Jesus was given divine power and authority. And yet if he were divine by nature, he would already have it and he could not be given them. And so therefore he cannot have been divine by nature. So let's uh, let's consider, this is that's an argument, the second objection. How does the diophysite respond to it? The diophysite response to this argument is that all language of empowerment or authorization, etc., anything that smacks of derivation, of derivative possession of power or authority, should be understood with reference to the humanity of Jesus. So once more, Gregory of Nazianzus, this receiving, right, receiving power, receiving authority, etc., this receiving belongs to his manhood. So it's the human nature, uh, according to Gregory. What's the problem with this line of argument? The rejoinder to make is that the New Testament never says this. There is no qualified talk of human of Jesus' human nature in the New Testament at all. Like I said, the word for nature, the words for nature, usia, fusis, these words are never used in connection with Jesus in the New Testament at all. Rather, the New Testament only ever talks about the person, Jesus himself. So for example, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. This sentence speaks of Jesus the person as being anointed with power. It doesn't say anything about his humanity. But one cannot be given what one already has. If Jesus were divine by nature, then he would already have power, and his becoming incarnate would not have changed this. Thus, this verse implies that Jesus is not divine by nature. If Jesus were God, he would already have power. And if he already has power, then he cannot be given it. And yet this verse says that Jesus is given power, and so therefore he must not have been God. Another one. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
if Jesus were divine by nature, if he were God, then he would already possess all authority in heaven and on earth. His becoming incarnate, his taking on humanity, would not have changed that about him since he does not cease to be God in becoming human. He retains his divinity even after the incarnation. But Jesus could not be given what he already has. And so even as incarnate, he already has authority in heaven and on earth. If he already possessed all authority in heaven and on earth, then he could not be given these things by his Father. And so therefore, this text implies that Jesus is not divine by nature. Another objection. Therefore, or another uh, text. Therefore, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, here's another same line of reasoning. If Jesus were divine by nature, he would already be as highly exalted as possible, and he would already possess the name that is above every name. His becoming incarnate would not have changed this about him, since he would not have ceased to be God in becoming human. And Jesus cannot be given what he already has. And yet this text says that Jesus was granted exaltation and the name that is above every name. This means that he is not divine by nature. So the diophysite theory, the, the theory of two natures, requires that one qualify all such language so that it refers to Jesus' humanity in, such, in some way. Either the human nature of Jesus is made powerful, or else Jesus is made capable of exercising power through his human nature, which he did not possess before. But the problem is, again, the New Testament does not say any of this. And the goal of interpretation is not to reconcile the text to one's preferred theory, but rather to ground one's theory in the text. Okay, so when we do theology, when we're talking about the interpretation of the New Testament, the goal is not to show how the New Testament agrees with our theory or how it can be reconciled with our theory. Rather, we're supposed to show how our theory has a basis in the New Testament itself. Uh, Hans George Gadamer, the hermeneutical philosopher of the uh, 20th century, he wrote that the first, last, and constant task of an interpreter is to let himself be guided by the things themselves, by what it is that he's trying to interpret, and to keep one's gaze fixed on the thing, on the interpreting, the interpreted thing, throughout all the constant distractions that originate in the interpreter himself. So your theories, your predilections, your desires, your wishes, your hopes, etc., you cannot allow those things to inform your interpretation of the text. You have to try as far as possible to let the text speak for itself. The way that I put this in my own works, the proper method in, inter is in interpretation is to let the text be magister, that's the Latin word for teacher, to let the text be the teacher and the interpreter to be discipulus, the disciple or the student. So you have to be taught by the text. You should not try to bend the text so that it agrees with you. Uh, we must allow the New Testament text to dictate how we interpret them rather than trying to reconcile their way of speaking with our own theories. So. In summary, the problem with diaphysitism is as follows. Not only does the New Testament never say that Jesus possesses divine power and authority by nature, but it also says that his divine power and authority is given to him by God. This implies that he is not divine by nature because he could not be given power and authority that he would possess naturally. The diaphysite doctrine requires that the New Testament's language in this respect be understood in a qualified way to refer to Christ's humanity. And yet the New Testament itself never says that. The qualification demanded by Diophysite theology is never found in the New Testament itself. The New Testament itself does not talk about Jesus the way that Diophysite theologians do. This suggests to me that the New Testament's theology is not Diophysite. It does not understand Jesus Christ to be a single person in two natures, one divine and the other human. Rather, I think that the New Testament presents Jesus as a human being by nature, um, but divine in various ways because of God's activity upon him. He's made divine in a sense because God filled him with the Holy Spirit and empowered him to perform his various divine works and uh, miracles and teachings and the rest. So this is my presentation. I hope that this has been useful to you. Uh, I'm very sorry that I could not present this live, but I, I hope that my comments are edifying to you and uh, help you to better understand the New Testament's way of talking about Christ. Uh, he's rich in the sense that he is God's son and he has God's power and authority at his disposal but he makes himself poor uh, because he does not use it for his own advantage, but only for the advantage of others. Uh, so I think that these passages don't refer to his incarnation. They refer rather to uh, his humility. Uh, nevertheless, all the rights and the privileges that belong to him as God's son 
he does not make use of for his own personal benefit. He has all these riches at his disposal, but he uses them for other person's sake. It's like if I were a millionaire, but I never spent any money on myself. I only spent all my money on other people. That would be basically me becoming poor, making myself poor for the sake of others, even though I am rich in a sense. So that's, I think, what is happening with Jesus. You know, this is a very good question. I think the whole question of two wills is very convoluted and difficult. They want to emphasize that there is never disagreement between the wills, uh, but nevertheless, each will retains its own proper functionality. So the human will, uh, for example, Christ may get hungry, he may get thirsty, he may get scared. Those are things that belong to his humanity. Um, and there is an element of willing or an element of volition or desire that is involved in those things that belongs to his humanity. But in his divinity, of course, he's unaffected. He only ever wills one thing. This talk of two wills is very complicated. It makes it sound as if you have sort of two people that are just kind of conjoined instead of one person. Because I'm not committed to this theory, I, I don't want to try to <laughs> solve the logical problems myself. I will leave it up to diophysite theologians to address this issue. But this has been a, a major problem. And even throughout history, um, a lot of people have looked to this particular issue of two wills as sort of like breaking apart the hypostatic union. If you have two wills, suddenly you have two people, basically, that just cooperate all the time. And that sounds Nestorian. Yeah, this is the idea that Jesus's divinity was at the very least severely impaired um, upon becoming incarnate. He, do he does not exercise or make use of any of his divine power. And he might even renounce it, set it aside for a time while he's incarnate. Uh, this is not a classical opinion. This is not the opinion of all the people who developed what today we understand as classical orthodoxy. Um, they insist, like I said, like Hillary and Gregory say, that Christ became man without ceasing to be God. So Christ does not set aside his divinity. He doesn't lose any of his divine power. He simply retains all that. This idea of kenosis was invented, I think, in the 18th or 19th, the 18th century by certain uh, radical Lutheran theologians to try to explain the lowliness and the humility of Christ in his humanity. It seems like, you know, he prays, he's afraid, he doesn't exercise omnipotence. He certainly doesn't seem to be omnipotent. Uh, for example, he can't perform miracles in certain places because of the weakness of the faith of the people there. Uh, and so they thought, well, maybe upon becoming incarnate, Jesus, Jesus' divinity was inhibited. The problem of this is that if you have this view, then the Father and the Son have to be two distinct beings. Uh, because the Father's divinity was not inhibited by the incarnation, only the Son's was. And so that means that the Son has his own divinity, the Father has his own divinity. So their their boundaries, you know, their, their being is circumscribed, so to speak. Um, and uh, there are boundaries and the, the father and the son are sort of two distinct things. Now that undermines their consubstantiality. It gives you kind of a tritheism because if the father and the son are two distinct things and the son's divinity can be inhibited while the son's, while the father's is not, that's like saying that I can get sick, but you, you remain healthy. The only way that I can get sick and you remain healthy, even though we are both human beings, is if we're two human beings. Um, and so for the son's divinity to be inhibited, but not the father's, they would have to be two gods. And so I think this kenosis theory entails basically a tritheism. Yes, I think that's exactly right. The divinity of Jesus in the New Testament is precisely the fact that he is God's agent. He is the person whom God set aside and empowered to act as God's agent in the world. And so he can do what he wants. He has God's authority on his side. That's why Philippians 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8, um, that's why those passages are so beautiful. Because even though Christ has God's authority and he can do what he wants, he doesn't act for his own benefit. He asks for the benefit of others. Uh, he, he makes use of the authority that he has as God's agent in order to benefit others and not himself. Like he says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, this is what is impressive about Christ. This is uh, what's beautiful about him is the fact that he has God's power at his own disposal and he has every reason to make use of it for his own benefit, and yet he doesn't. Uh, he uses it only to benefit others. I think when you read John's gospel, for example, very carefully, that is exactly what Jesus is saying in all of his discussions with the Judeans who are critiquing him or objecting to him in various ways. The Father set me, as, set me aside and sent me into the world, uh, and I do his will. I don't do anything for myself. I only do what I see him doing. Um, I think Jesus there everywhere points to the fact that he has been set apart as God's agent in the world. And this is really the fulfillment of human destiny. You know, a lot of contemporary scholars argue that what it means for human beings to be created in the image and likeness of God in Genesis, it means that they're God's agents. They are the ones who act with God's authority in the world to take care of it and to benefit it and to act for its good. So Jesus is really fulfilling the destiny of every human being acting as God's agent. Uh, and we also ourselves have to learn 
what it means to be God's agent, what's the right way to do this, what is the right way to fulfill the responsibility and the calling that we all have from God as human beings. I certainly think that these concepts appear in the Bible, but not in those words. Uh, so for example, Genesis talks about all the animals being created each according to their kind. That is, you know, basically the word nature, right? So dogs are one kind of thing, cats are one kind of thing, human beings are one kind of thing. So there's the idea that each thing has its own proper being. It has its own proper essence or nature. Uh, there's a certain way that it is. It has boundaries. Human beings can learn language, cats cannot. Dogs can do certain things, fish cannot, right? So everything has its own proper boundaries, its own possibilities uh, of being, um, and it's not another kind of thing. So I'm a human being, I'm not a fish. Um, a cat is not a dog, a horse is not a bear, and so on. So these concepts do appear in the Bible. And the person, the concept of a person is just the concept of an individual. I think the Bible, it has a clear notion of the individual. Um, for example, the prophet Ezekiel, when he says that a person will not be punished for the sins of the fathers, but each person will die for his own sin. There, it seems to me, is precisely this concept of person. Um, it's the concept of an individual who is not someone else, who stands out, who is unique, uh, who can be uniquely addressed, who is uniquely responsible for his or her own life. The, the concept of person, the concept of being, these concepts are certainly in the Bible. They, they appear in the Bible. But the question is, d does the Bible discourse about Christ and about the Father and the Holy Spirit as though these were three persons with one being? Or about Christ as if he were a single person with two ways of being? That's where the rubber hits the road. Um, I do not think that the Bible talks about Christ as though he were a single person in two natures. I think rather it talks about him as though he were a single person in one nature, but with a special calling from God. So there are things that normally would be impossible for him that are made possible because of the role that he plays in God's providence. God especially empowers him to do various things. Uh, by nature, he's a human being, but by God's empowerment and by God's grace, he has the ability to do typically divine things. And so you can say that he shares in the divine being um, in this derivative sense, but not by becoming God. He remains a human being. He's only a human being by nature but God empowers him and makes use of him in a certain way. Um, so that's what I would say in brief. I would say that the concepts of person and being are present in the Bible. Uh, it doesn't use those words exactly. The concepts themselves are there, uh, but I do not think that the way that the Bible talks about Christ in, in relation to God um, suggests that he is a single person in two natures uh, or that God is one person in three being or, or one, uh, one being in three persons or anything like that. Yeah, this is a good question. I mean, basically what we're asking is if, if it's possible to sort of jump across categories, to be one kind of thing and then to become another kind of thing. The theologian David Bentley Hart in his recent book, it's called You Are Gods, published by Notre Dame University Press. You know, he gives this example. You cannot take a rabbit and turn it into a turnip. A rabbit cannot become a turnip, right? The, the reason why is because rabbits and turnips are too far apart from each other. They're just totally different kinds of things. Um, and you cannot transform a rabbit into a turnip. What you could do is have a rabbit, you know, go poof out of existence and a turnip exists in its proper, you know, where it was there earlier. So you could replace a rabbit with a turnip. You could annihilate a rabbit and form a turnip out of it. Uh, but a rabbit cannot become a turnip. You cannot sort of cross categories like this. They're just too different. So the question is, say Jesus existed as an angel or as a human, can he become a human being? Can, can, can he become a, can he go from being an angel or a divine being to becoming a human being? You might think that they're just two different sort of categories and you cannot make that jump. You, you can replace the angel with a human being, but you cannot have an angel become a human being because they're just too different. The only way you can have one thing become another sort of thing is if there's a kind of a continuity between them. For example, uh, the reason why I can go from being a bachelor to being married is because there's a continuity. You can be a male who is a bachelor or you can be a male who is married. And so the maleness, this sort of common term, allows me to transfer from being one to the, the next. You can go, for example, from being a child to being an adult because you can be a child human and an adult human right so the, there's a common term humanity and you can go from being a child human to being an adult human there's something the same uh, there's a continuity between these two things that allows you to go from being one to being the other david bentley hart interestingly enough argues in that book that the only way that god could become incarnate if he's already incarnate there has to be some sort of continuity between god prior to the incarnation and christ as a human being after the incarnation and so David Bentley Hart will argue that only God who is already human can become incarnate. So he's, he's trying to suggest that between human beings and God, there's not this, there's, excuse me, there's not this radical difference. It's not like the difference between a turnip and a, a rabbit. Um, there's a kind of a continuity. Uh, there's something the same here, uh, which allows God to go from being God and not human to being God and human.
Um, this is controversial because in the Catholic tradition, uh, the idea was that God is unlike everything. He's in a totally different category. He is not like us. He is not like the animals. He's not like the material world. God is just a totally different kind of thing altogether. And so you might think that if God is just a totally different kind of thing altogether, you cannot make this jump. You cannot jump from one category to the next. David Bentley Hart suggests that no, there is a fundamental continuity between God and human beings, uh, and you need to have that continuity in order for the incarnation to be possible. These are vexed questions. I don't know exactly what David Bentley Hart would say in response to this. I mean, he, he believes in the incarnation, so I'm assuming that he thinks that Jesus can become a human being while being God. But his answer to that is because he's already human in a sense before the incarnation. Now, how does that work out? I don't know. You can, you can talk to him about it. But basically the idea here is that um, the, only, the only way you can have God become a human being um, is if God is already human, either imperfectly, incompletely, or something. There's some sort of continuity between God as God and God as a human being that allows him to cross that, you know, cross that channel, so to speak. This is an interesting question. My sense is that theologians will differ about how they prefer to talk about these things. So some people will say that Jesus is not a human person. He's a divine person with a human nature. Uh, some people will say that he is a human person in the sense that he's a person who has a human nature. It really depends. Um, they will say uh, that Jesus is not an independently existing human person that comes into relationship with the Son. So for example, it's not that Jesus is one person and the divine son is another person and they just sort of collaborate with each other or cooperate. Uh, they don't accept that point of view. Uh, but would they say that Jesus is a human person? If you'll accept this definition, that a human person is a person with a human nature, then yeah, they'll accept that Jesus is a person with a human nature. It's just that he assumes a human nature and he didn't begin with it. His divine nature is by default. His human nature is by assumption. I have written a paper where I, I argue that if Christ has two natures, then he didn't really die. Um, and the reason why is this, you can say that he died in his humanity, but his humanity is not all of him. It's just a part of him. It's not even an essential part of him because even while his humanity dies, he retains the life and power and knowledge and etc. that belongs to him by his divine nature. It's like, for example, if my right arm becomes entirely necrotic, a part of me has died, but that doesn't mean that I've died because I retain the power of life and consciousness and volition and thought and so on. So a part of me can die, but it doesn't follow that I died. So also Jesus's humanity can have died, his body, his soul, etc., can have died, but that doesn't mean that he has lost all consciousness, has lost all power. That doesn't mean that he's unable to do anything anymore. He retains all those things because he's also divine. Uh, and so uh, you might think that Jesus can't die if he has two natures. If he has a part of him, a, a part of his life, that is unaffected by what happens in his humanity, then even if his humanity dies, he retains his divine life, then he hasn't really died. He's sort of partly died, he's half died. A part of him has died maybe, uh, but he has not really died. And so you might think that if Jesus has two natures and he can't die, and if Jesus can't die, then he can't make atonement for sins by means of his death. So here's one argument, I think, how you could argue that a pre-existent Jesus cannot really atone for sins. Essential words there, morphe, homoiosis, uh, these Greek words uh, refer to the appearance of a thing, the way it looks from the outside. And I think what Paul is doing there is he's talking about the way Jesus looked from the outside in, his, in the course of his ministry. Um, what does it mean for Jesus to have uh, the form or the appearance of God or of a God? There's a book that came out in the form of a God by Andrew Perriman. It came out just this or last year. Uh, and he argues that the background for that passage in Philippians chapter 2 is going to be a sort of a, a Gentile Christian background. And so the, the talk about Jesus as being in the form of a God, uh, first of all, it, it, it would say that Jesus was in the form of a God rather than in the form of God, because this way of thinking about powerful human beings as being like gods uh, probably would have come quite naturally to people from a Gentile background. Um, so what does it mean that Jesus was in the form of a God? Uh, well, it means that he was very powerful, very wise. He had a great following. He could perform miracles and wonders and so on. Uh, I think when it says that Jesus was in the form of a God, it meant it had to do with his external appearance. He looked like a divine being, not like God himself, because God, of course, has no image or, or rather no form. Um, but he looked divine. He performed wondrous miracles. He had great teachings. He had followers. He, uh, but nevertheless, although he had the form of a God and he had the sort of the external appearance of a God, he humbled himself and he took on the appearance of a mere man. Uh, another point that I want to make about 
uh, the word there. When, it, when the, the word anthropos in that passage, uh, when it says that Christ came in the likeness of men, um, anthropon, I don't think that it means in the nature of hum, human beings. I think what it means more is he was uh, in the appearance of mere men. All right, the word anthropos uh, sometimes can mean a mere ordinary man, not a human being, but a mere ordinary man as opposed to something greater or more special. Uh, and an example of this, for example, is in uh, Galatians chapter one, where Paul says, I did not learn my gospel from a man, but from Christ Jesus. Now, he doesn't mean to say that Jesus Christ is not a human being. He means to say that Jesus Christ is not a mere human being. He's not just an ordinary Joe Schmo. So the word anthropos, especially when it is used in comparison with something greater, does not mean a human being like nature, uh, but rather just a mere ordinary person, uh, a, a mere Joe Schmo. So when Paul says that he did not learn his, his gospel from a mere Joe Schmo, but from Jesus Christ, I think something similar is happening here in Philippians. Christ had the form of a God, uh, but he was made in the likeness of a mere, a mere man, an ordinary Joe Schmo. There was nothing special about him. He didn't, you know, he didn't walk around in robes. Uh, he didn't have a golden crown on his head. People didn't bow at his feet. He didn't live in a, in a, in a castle with a, a throne, eating out of silver plates and so on. He looked like an ordinary person. He humbled himself, even though he had all this power at his disposal. Like I said earlier, he humbled himself. He looked like an ordinary Joshmo. And this is especially true of him in, at his crucifixion, where there is nothing at all about him that suggests that he's a god. He's abandoned by all of his friends. He doesn't perform any miracles. Uh, nothing spectacular happens to him. And eventually he's crucified. When Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 6 and 7, talk about likeness, form, appearance, and so on, I think it has to do with appearance. It has nothing to do with nature. Uh, Jesus is by nature a human being, but he has the form of a God. He has the appearance of a God because of the miraculous works that take place through him. And yet he humbles himself. He takes on the appearance of a slave, uh, the likeness of mere men, because he serves others. He doesn't use his power for his own benefit. Uh, rather, he uses it only for the benefit of others. And especially in his dying moments, he's totally alone. And there's nothing special about his external appearance at all. He's rather wretched. But that's how I would understand these these uh, verses. They talk about what Jesus looked like from the outside. They talk about the way that he, you know, the impression that he would give people. And especially in light of his humility, uh, humbling himself in, in the course of his trial and at his trial, especially in the crucifixion, he just looked like an ordinary person. Here is my book, uh, Theological Authority in the Church, uh, Reconsidering Traditionalism and Hierarchy, with a foreword by one of my professors from seminary, Veli Mati Karkainen. Um, basically what I argue in the book is that nobody in the church has any further theological authority than that of, uh, derivatively, fallibly, and in principle, reversibly bearing witness to the teachings of Jesus and the works of God in him. So nobody in theology, nobody in the church is the boss of theology except for Christ himself. And what we can do is bear witness to Christ's teachings. Um, in a fallible way that opens us up to correction and reversal if need be. Uh, but Christ alone is uh, the single unconditional authority in, in the church. Uh, and I respond a lot to um, Roman Catholic arguments about theological authority in the church, about the papacy, about the authority of the apostles and so on.